Hey, what's up, everybody? You're listening to Cyberpunk Uncensored. Uh, this episode is going to be about the world history of cyberpunk. Uh, we're going to take it from the beginning there and through red and up to 2077. But before we do that, I want to introduce my guests today. I have Patrick and Chris with me. What's up, guys? Hello. Hey. So, How's yeah. it going? What I'd like to do is uh, just have you guys introduce yourselves, maybe give a little background to your, you know, your history in cyberpunk and just in role playing and whether you're a player or a GM in general. Um, but yeah, just introduce yourselves. Why don't Patrick, you want to start? Yeah, certainly. So Patrick, uh, Patrick Knells, my full name. So, um, and I have a little, just started a thing with my brother called Two Brothers Gaming uh, that we're finally starting and we're getting ready for a cyberpunk campaign. Uh, which harkens back to the early days when I started RPGs, which was in the early 80s, started off with Traveler. And I subjected him to many hours of um, me refereeing him uh, through whatever crazy stories I had. So picked up Cyberpunk in the early 90s, uh, and played it uh, quite a bit uh, before my group kind of went through the, you know, College, post-college breakup and, and that kind of stuff and have worked my way back into it in uh, recent years. So I'm really stoked for both Cyberpunk Red and Cyberpunk 2077 and uh, oh, prepping right. a campaign to start uh, sometime in September, start uh, pushing it out. So kind of set in 2054. So a few years after Red, uh, but before 2077. So Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name's uh, Chris Bennett, and I have been playing RPG since the mid-80s. Um, a group of friends and I, we played a lot of Palladium stuff, uh, you know, all the Turtles, all the Robotech, you know, you name it. We did, and then we got into Rifts. And then uh, my Game Master in that group brought home the 2013 box set when it first came out. And he kind of looked at it, and he was like, I think this is more your bailiwick, you know? And he kind of handed it off to me, and I've been running with it ever since. Nice. Um, I've got, you know, every book that was ever published, with the exception of the, the first two interfaces. Very cool. Uh, and awesome. uh, I've been been playing. Uh, I was in the Navy for a while. And, uh, I mean, even underway overseas, you know, we I had a game going, you know? <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I love that. Awesome. Well, you know, I think we all have a similar background here. We all love role-playing games. We've been playing for a long time, and uh, Cyberpunk is one of our favorites. Uh, For me, it is the favorite. You know, I started with Dungeons & Dragons, but got into Cyberpunk back in the day and just never stopped. I love it. I still play D&D, but uh, Cyberpunk is my number one passion. I love that shit. It's absolutely fantastic. I love it, Um, and uh, it's such a great series great lore great history and it you know it's just so exciting to be able to play in it and it's so i think it's so great to see so many people picking it up yeah uh, i was just going to say uh, the other thing too is great community like i really yeah. love the fact that like when i stream live games or i do the podcast or i you know promote any of the things i got going on i get support like people actually share it and like it and like they're responsive like there's almost virtually no no trolls you know there's some yeah. people that are you know come across almost elitist sometimes like you know don't post that that's not cyberpunk that's this type of and you know like some people <laughs> but that just shows their passion behind it you know what i mean but what i love yeah, is yeah. uh there's no like uh, i don't know i just don't see a lot of negativity it's fucking really cool i love the community it's well, i remember when the I first saw the reading list, you know, the suggested reading list in, in the game books, and I went through every one of those novels, and like I had never heard of Gibson before I picked up the Cyberpunk book, you know, and he's one of my favorite authors. I, I think the way he writes is just amazing because it's like, yeah, it's just up there, you know. Yeah, I totally. just can't say enough about Gibson. Gibson and. Uh, Sterling and uh, Rucker. I'm a big Rudy Rucker fan. Like all the Wear series, those, those were awesome. Nice. Very tongue in cheek. Um, yeah, I love that about John the, Williams. The the whole cyberpunk genre. No matter which angle you cut it, 
I just love the tongue in cheek style humor and attitude and just wise assness, I guess you'd say, um, to, to everyone's attitude. I mean, just like in, in the rule books, core books, uh, any of the cyberpunk ones, you'll, you'll see like sarcasm and weird shit in the writing that's just, you don't see in other games or in other reading, you know? It just has an attitude and I love it. That's the, that's the punk. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, let's dive into this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through this world timeline. Everybody probably is familiar with, uh, you know, the new Red Starter kit that recently came out. And it kind of lays it out and extends past what 2020 and other supplement books had, which is very cool. But then you also have a copy of the Dark Horse Press uh, 2077 Art World book. And that has, you know, takes it even farther, uh, correct? Yes, it does. Yeah, so what we'll do is I'll just cruise through the, these titles and years. Um, we can blaze through it. Feel free to interject if you have something important about one of these things. But otherwise, I'm just going to go through the titles for the reference, you know? And then once yeah. we get up through red and there, maybe we can get a, get a little more detailed. But yeah, it starts in, uh, from 1990 to 1993, a secret uh, co-op launched by the Gang of Four. A coalition of government agencies effectively ends federal democracy in the U.S. So it kind of all starts in 1990 for all this. But um, but going on through 1993, from there, uh, the start of the first Central American conflict, uh, breakup of the Soviet state, uh, what is this, Euro Space Agency launches, uh, Chu-2 uh, in development with Biotechnica, first archaeology built in ruins of uh, Jersey City. <laughs> Uh, the Treaty of 1992 establishes the European Economic Community. A U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, develops and spreads uh, several designer plagues worldwide targeting coca and op opium plants. Uh, so I, that's kind of the beginning of designer plagues. I love that word. <laughs> I have a, uh, yes. a custom, uh, you know, I, I run two different weekly games. I stream live from the, on the Mulligan Live YouTube channel. And um, I, I have one of them right now kind of based around a designer plague um, being masked as a, as a normal uh, mood enhancing drug uh, for clearing out parts of the city and shit like that. It's pretty interesting. It gets pretty deep. Um, but anyways, moving on. So a savage drug war uh, breaks out and uh, that's between Eurocorp backed drug dealers and DEA all over the Americas. Uh, first use of high energy lasers, uh, first TRC bio, uh, what is it? Bi biological Logic. Interfa interface chips, okay, developed in Munich, uh, United Germany. Uh, AV4 aerodyne assault vehicles are developed with increasing riots in U.S. Uh, urban zones. So it sounds like, the, you know, the beginning of combat zones and AVs and all that. It just all kind of starts between 1990 and 1993. Uh, the rehabilitation for U.S. attacks. Uh, Colombian drug lords uh, detonate small tactical nuclear device in New York, 15,000 killed. Um, so 1994 to 1995, the world stock market crash of 94, U.S. Uh, European community and the neo-Soviets start a, a new space race. Uh, what is this? Kilimanjaro mass driver begins construction under joint agreement between ESA and Pan-African Alliance. Uh, 1996, the collapse of the United States. So 1996, the, st the United States collapses. Uh, nomad riots, first appearance of booster gangs, U.S. Constitution suspended. So it sounds like, you know, 1996 is a very pivotal moment, you know. That's when it all, you start hearing about the booster gangs and everything. The tech that begins a little before then, but that's when the, the collapse happens, you know. Yes. Uh, 1997 yeah. to 98, Mideast meltdown, Rocker Boy Mansion killed. Uh, Manson killed in England. Uh, the drought of 98 reduces most of the uh, Midwest to parched grasslands. A huge earthquake shatters Los Angeles. The Pacific Ocean uh, takes over 35% of the city. Uh, 65,000 are killed, estimated. Uh, let's see, 1999, cults begin to appear, uh, predicting an apocalypse. Uh, let's see, Tycho, Tycho Colony established, 2000. More cults running them. Uh, let's see. Running them. Psycho colonies on the moon. So that's the that first one that gets up there. Yeah. And then uh, extended family poser gangs are established. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. I like poser gangs. Uh, Crystal Palace Space Station. Yeah. Uh, wasting plague hits U.S. and Europe, killing hundreds of thousands. 2001, the framework of the net firmly in place with construction of the WorldStat network. Uh, let's see, 2002, 
food crash. So mutated plant uh, virus wipes out Canadian and neo-Soviet crops. So it's really shitty. Hey, <laughs> can yeah. I interrupt for one second? What's that? Can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. yeah. Um, as you guys were, as you were reading that, it just kind of struck me that I wonder what Home of the Brave, if there was any variation between the timeline and Home of the Brave, you know, because it's about yeah. the collapse of the United States and the nomads. And it's almost word for word. I mean, there's a little bit different verbiage, but I, I just wanted to make that point that I'm following along actually in the, the Home of the Brave source book, and it's it hasn't changed. Yeah, exactly. No, I think all, all of it leading up, they're, they're locking it in. If anything, uh, they might elaborate a little more as newer releases come, but I think they're kind of sticking to the plan. You know, they're sticking to the world, you know, that they've established, which I love. It's cool. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, let's, let, let's uh, see where it, where it takes us here. We've got uh, 2003, the Second Central American War, uh, Media Star, Tesla, Johannesson, uh, Exposes Secret, NSA Transcripts of the First Central American Conflict. Uh, the remainder of the Gang of Four is swept away on a wave of reform. 2004, First Cloned Tissue Growth in Vitro. Uh, Tesla, Johannesson Assassinated in Cairo. To, uh, for the First Corporate War, 2004 to 2005. Uh, to, I, I love uh, corporate wars. I think that's such a cool thing in cyberpunk, how it's like corporate over government for the most part. And it's just yeah. so fucking corrupt and scary and dark and big. And I love when uh, just how they came up with the idea of uh, calling it, you know, the first, second, third, fourth corporate war. But um, Cyber Modem invented uh, first human clone growth in vitro in 2006. Mindless. It only lives for six hours. I love that. Uh, it's like the one detail of 2006 that they put in here. So. <laughs> exactly. In all of 2006, they pretty much cloned a human. But he was only chilling for like six hours. <laughs> um, 2007, the second second corporate war it goes from 2007 all the way to 2010. Uh, brain dance is developed at UC Santa Cruz, California. That's cool. 2020. Now here we are. Oh shit. Let's see. Does it mention Corona? Uh, carbon plague <laughs> incident. Oh shit. A corporate AV crash released a nanotech plague on the outskirts of Night City. The plague ravages the city for two weeks, then mysteriously stops. Chicago rebuilding project begins. 2021, Euro Aquacorp, Sino, attempt, uh, attempts to acquire bankrupt Aquacorp, IHAG. Yep. That's the start of the, really the fourth corporate war. That's the, that's really the incentives behind it that begins. Yeah. Uh, covert oper in 2022, covert operations expand Arasaka security and Militech spar to see who will control outcome of Sino and Otech war. So it's all beginning right there. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bart Mog. Oh, this is this is where uh, uh, data crash starts too. So in t in 2022, yeah. I mean it's just pivotal. It's it's the beginning of the fourth corporate war. Plus, uh, the data crash virus starts because of. Uh, uh, how, how does he pronounce his first name? Roche? Bart Moss? Raish. Raish. I think it's Raish. Yeah. Yeah, there's no uh, accent on the E there. Um, but yeah, he, he it's when he was killed, and that's when Data Crash basically activates. You know, it's kind of a, a dead man switch. So when he went down, that came in, and that just, that's what brought us to the current Netrunner uh, way that it runs. And God damn, I'm so glad he got killed and that happened because the old Netrunning way was just so complicated and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little did he know that he was making uh, the gaming life easier uh, right. for future games. Yes. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, here we are, the fourth corporate war. So, it's just, it, this, again, 2022. It's all starting now. Our Asaka and Militech are the ones pretty much holding that down for the two companies. They're the ones making it happen and doing the battling, you know? Um, yeah. Chicago's rebuilding rebuilding project collapses as Arasaka corporate factions detonate virus bombs in an effort to deny the city to Militech. Um, a data crash virus now infects 78.2% of the net. A uh, seven-hour war happens in 2022. Uh, 2023, total breakdown of intentional trade, international trade. Sorry, it's moving the paper. Uh, August 20th, uh, 23, Night City Holocaust. 
Yep. Militech, sorry, I'm going to the next page here. Militech is nationalized by the U.S. President Elizabeth Kress uh, through the expedient of reactivating Militech CEO General Donald Lundy's Re Reserve Commission. Uh, let's see, beginning, beginning of the time of the Red. So, okay, so it, it, this is like the beginning of the time of the Red, I guess, is, is 2023. That's the establishing the beginning of the time of the Red. Um, that's, that's when, you know, atmospheric particles from the nuclear blast in Night City, as well as debris from orbital rock uh, strikes. So, yeah, I guess the important thing to mention, you know, is, is the... In 2023, since it is the beginning of the red, that that's the pocket nuke incident. You know, that's that's what they refer to with the Night City Holocaust and the beginning of the time of the red because of the fallout in the sky, um, the bloody red color. I love that. Um, I, I I love the fact that it's like they took cyberpunk and found a way to make it even tougher, even like grittier and fucking more raw. You know? Yeah, I I keep imagining that the sky like that in uh, Blade Runner 2049 when he goes out to uh, yeah. Vegas and all that, just like that red kind of sand and dusty and destroyed exactly. space. Yeah, and like in the city, like uh, we were talking about this, you know, I have a, an episode where we do a whole tribute to Night City, but how it is there, just watching the live game feeds from Mike Pondsmith that he was doing a while back. Um, he describes like when you enter shops and buildings and whatever, there's like wash stations, you know, that wash the chemical off of you and all this shit. So it's like, I just picture like, God damn, it's like, looks more raw. It's just tougher. And then people are like wet and pissed off and just everything's gritty. And like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, a, yeah. I feel like they made it even rougher. It's insane. Oh, but, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, 2025 is the end of the fourth corporate war. The net is officially down. Uh, let's see here. Japanese government almost breaks down. 2026 to 2030. Uh, let's see. The diaspora begins. Uh, what's that? The groups displaced from wrecked cities now set out to reclaim nearby cities abandoned since the collapse. They are supported by nomads who set up convoys between cities. And that's a good thing to mention, too, in red. Like, so cool how because of everything, you know, breaking down they have the whole new net running thing because the systems are different they're all independently run like in, in independent systems you know it's not like this international internet or whatever um that you can jack into remotely like as previous net runners could but then also how transportation and everything went down like fuck now it's all you have to rely on nomads to kind of escort you from city to city safely or you just gotta risk traveling the wastelands you know and it's just it just sounds rough and awesome <laughs> yeah yeah it's a yeah, it's a kind of a great way to push sort of the nomad storylines that are out there and kind of how they have to adapt and change to this entire uh red and the, and the further collapse and, and all that military, the, the nationalization of Militech and stuff. So, totally. and, and that breakdown of shipping, I think is so like key. I, I was, uh, I think I was reading or listening to uh, a Mike Pondsmith interview where he, he talked about like, Hey, like if you stopped it today, what would happen? Like you, you wouldn't be able to get parts right. or stuff. You wouldn't be able to get vehicles. You wouldn't, you know, food transportation would break down. It's just, um, it, we're kind of living you, that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. To a degree, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally. No, but I love what you're saying. Like, you know, they, it, it almost gives nomads more depth and options and like, uh, I don't know, a bigger purpose, like, like other roles kind of have in their own right in the past. Whereas in the past nomads, you always kind of picture them like the Mad Max beyond Thunderdome guy, like the traveler or the, you know what I mean? The, the stories were always very similar where it was like, you know, they're, you know, doing doing gigs with the party or in the city temporarily away from their family or this. You know? And now it's like, I don't know, there, there's all these quote unquote actual jobs or whatever that are that are, I don't know, extremely important to survival and in, in the country and the world. You know, like they are the transportation system now for the most part, you know? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. But, um, yeah. but, okay, so moving on, 2026 through 2030 still, you know, there's a massive looting of old tech and abandoned storehouses, uh, very limited VPNs uh, within corporate parks. Arasaka breaks into three uh, warring factions. 
Uh, let's see, the United States is now a functional dictatorship under President Elizabeth Crest's state of emergency. Yeah, she made it a state of emergency and, po you know, suspended voting and shit, like insane. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and for Night City people, did not help Night City. She, after the nuke went off, she left it, you know, it was it was independent, but she just left it. She offered no help um, and basically said, you're on your own. Right. Um Let's see, 2030 through 2035, resettlement of uh, suburban Night City, uh, reestablishing of Nomad High Roads, start of city nets, local VPNs established in some of the reclaimed cities, rumors that rocker boy Johnny Silverhand's body has been found in cold storage in a body bank uh, in the wreckage of old Night City arise, start of Night City reconstruction. Uh, let's see, 2035 to 2045, which is the present day of red. Uh, first wave cities start reclamation under support from local governments and remaining megacorps. Uh, we have no United States until we have a country again, President Elizabeth Kress says. Uh, rebuilding of old factories and individuals start replacing lost tech. Rumors spread that legendary solo Morgan Blackhand has been spotted in various first wave cities. Netwatch attempts to clear out the rabbits and reestablish yeah. the old net. Yeah. Raish is old. Uh, his uh, time, the data crash they, they sent off, he sent all those AIs out into the, the net that are often crazy, have specific goals they set them up for. Bad place to be. Yep. Established uh, establishment of first data pools, information servers and exchange systems designed for open use within limits of a city. Uh, rise of the f uh, first mega buildings to handle population expansion. I love that too because uh, I love the idea of like you know mega complexes and stuff where it's like tiny communities within like a huge apartment complex that maybe houses you know six thousand people or, or whatever and you know has courtyards of just like anything you need in shops and ready tent community setups and like I just love the idea of mega buildings um, it just sounds so uh, I don't know dismal yet futuristic and, and communal yeah. within itself like it's just crazy which uh, you can see lots of pictures of similar shit I always see from uh, China <laughs> people are always <laughs> posting like these mega apartment buildings from China and, and places <laughs> uh, yeah and i'm like holy shit <laughs> yeah yeah and you almost don't have to leave like every day's there like you right. throw everything every convenience is there you know maybe yeah. you have to shuffle off to work if but even then it may be through part of the building anyways so, yeah. <laughs> right now let's see the be yeah the beginning of new uh, factories are placing upgrading or repairing old and scattered tech i like that part too because it's like just as red is going it's like that's the beginning of them just finally starting to like start factories and into you know independent techies are like making things and like they're just starting to build back so it's like it, it 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 got more dangerous it got grittier it got dirtier from the nuclear fallout and everything going on which is amazing to me i can't even believe they could do that but then they still somehow were able to still hold on to like the idea of tech and like cyber technology and weapons and all the cool shit because you have everything that was that was already and now it might be harder to find it or get it and things which is even grittier but then you have in red like they're just starting to get factories back and there's you know people are starting to invent and recreate and rebuild so it's like i don't know it's just like that that perfect pivotal point where like it can still be gritty and raw and fucked up but yet still futuristic you know <laughs> does that make sense yes oh yeah yes. yeah it's like it's the epitome of what i think it was it was gibson that said you know High, low life, high tech. I high mean, tech, low life. Yeah, high yeah. tech, low life. So yeah, it's it kind of it pu really pops that in and gives it you know like hey you have to make do with with what you got you know it's there's however many you know millions upon millions of cell phones and we somehow keep them working you know you're not getting any new ones right but we're gonna keep these working yeah the, so. the street has its own uses for yes things oh yeah. But yeah, so that brings us up to red. And now, you know, Patrick, you've got the 2077 book. If you want to take it from here and take us through it, that'd be awesome. Yeah, so they kind of divided up in a couple of sections. So they, uh, 
There's the uh, post-war 2024 to 2035, uh, which mostly matches exactly what's here. And then they have a section called reunification that's uh, 2035 through uh, 2069. Um, and, uh, and it's just, they've got a couple of paragraphs here, but it, it's uh, basically um, a lot of the American cities were abandoned. They start building this, this stuff up as, as we've covered. Um, there's a lot of speculation about, you know, Arasaka and, and what happened with that. Um, and the situation in Europe uh, doesn't go so, you know, it doesn't go well for the old mega corporations. Uh, they're, they're, they were weakened by the war and kind of Europe is able to kind of reassert uh, some national government control over stuff. Um, and in relation to Arasaka in Asia, which Arasaka was humiliated, uh, they did break up, but they restarted to build right they 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 kind of settled their own little civil war and then they they start the the rebuilding process um and so and that the, the this book calls it the reunification period and then you get to some i think some of the really interesting stuff uh after that um is the they call it the unification or metal wars uh 2069 to 2070. um and so there's a new president of the new United States, Rosalind Myers. Uh, oh. She presents, yeah. So at, at the end of 2069, recently elected uh, President Rosalind Myers presented a unification program to extend federal rule over the rogue free states under the pretense of strengthening a nation. So, uh, and basically conflict was inevitable. So. So they're like re re reestablishing a country ultimately, right? Is that what it sounds yes. like? Yeah, they're kind of yeah. trying to re reunform all the independent colonies, quote unquote. Yeah. So, so the still nationalized Militech and the United States declare war on the separatist states: Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, Arizona, Nevada, and Northern California. Washington, Oregon, and Idaho kind of remain neutral. So they, you know, they give they give some concessions to the federal government, um, but they not enough they to basically become part of the United States, but still retain their independence. But you know, kind of enough to keep them off. Um, the free states are secretly supported by Arasaka with weapons and security advisors. That's so cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> That's so, so cool. yeah, and of course, like they're on the outs, right? Like Arasaka is like not welcome in the united states or north america at all so this is this is them getting back in right right um and so the and they also because it was using kind of cutting edge military technology it is also called the metal wars um that's so it's got kind of got those two names um night city avoided the fighting but only barely northern and southern california both independent states wound up on opposite sides of the war. The South allying with the United States uh, and the North attempting to remain independent. The people of Night City basically were kind of stuck in the middle because it's an independent city. Yeah, it's been like so, that, all, you know, so it's yeah, kind of it's, it's yeah. always been its own weird place within other weird shit going on yes. you know like i love that yeah. about it it's like uh i don't know the melting pot within the melting fucking pot you know what i mean <laughs> it's yes. like crazy yeah yeah it's, it's nuts so and in early 2070 20 uh, so 2070 a new united states army division advances to the outskirts of the city but an invasion is prevented thanks to the quick actions of Councilman Lucius Ryan. Um, and by the way, I, and later in the book, he's mentioned as the current mayor in 2077. So, oh, shit. Uh, yeah. So, so he protected the city, basically earned him some respect, yeah. and that got him into a position, you know, political position there. Sounds like. Yes. But here's what he did was he besieged beseech the long shunned Arasaka Corporation for protection. Within days, an Arasaka supercarrier arrived in Coronado Bay, and the North New United States Army withdrew. Oh Ooh. yeah. So after that, the Treaty of Unification is signed. 
by the United States and the Free States Coalition, basically ending the war. So the Free States retained their autonomy, but agreed to participate in a new federal government and cease hostilities among themselves. Wow. No one's happy with it. Yeah. I love that. Like I said, they just they keep finding ways to evolve cyberpunk have it make you know sense storyline politically aesthetically just everything that they do it just keeps getting grittier and crazier and somehow they pull it off and yet you know maintain the balance like they can still main like you can still play within it they'll have it make enough sense that you can live you can get around you can do stuff but they just keep making it more dangerous more fucked up and they're just so creative with that shit man i love it <laughs> yeah yeah it's great but that's the that's the foothold for arasaka so i know a lot of people were like how's arasaka get back into night city yeah well, that basically ryan made a deal with the devil yeah you come in and uh you know help us out and we'll let you in and in 2070 Night City allows Arasaka to build their new American headquarters downtown wow. on the site where the previous building see that? was destroyed. Oh, wow. Yeah, see, like that, I, I wouldn't like say I was there, you know. I, that I couldn't get behind, but but I don't blame him for calling them in for some protection when, uh, you know, he just wants to maintain his independence. They all, you know, the whole city wants to maintain its independence, and they're just getting fucking surrounded by Militech and you know what I mean? Like I kind of don't blame them if you, you have nothing, you have uh, no one to turn to, <laughs> you know, yeah. what would you do? Yeah. You either give up yeah. or you give up or you call your enemy's enemy, you know? Yeah, exactly. You've been nuked. <laughs> right. You really? Do you want to, you've been rebuilding. Do you really want to just have everything go to hell again? No. You're, yeah. It's, you, you can't blame them for, for kind of saying this is the best bad deal I can make. Right. Which of course is kind of cyberpunk, right? Sometimes you're just you're making the best oh, totally. bad deal you can you can get away with. Okay. How, it, how do I get out of this alive? Yeah, no, it, it always seems like it's, you know, what's the the lesser of the evils? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. There's really no angels and shit, man. It's always the lesser of the evils, you know? Yeah. Yeah, morality is always gray. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of where the, the history kind of goes. There's a lot of other kind of like stuff scattered kind of through, but that they kind of take the history up to there. They go through uh, a number of the districts and kind of talk about it. I think there's, you know, the, the city very much changes in a lot of its geography, uh, you know, because they're getting rid of the radioactive stuff, putting in landfills and, and that kind of thing. And uh, one of the districts is Watson. Uh, which is north of the city center. And there was uh, basically this uh, kind of uh, waterfront um, that was taken over by Arasaka. And basically it's this, from the sounds of what I was reading, it's, a, it's this walled area in Watson that if you, they's like, you don't go near that if you don't need to, because wow. it's really dangerous. But so they're doing all sorts of stuff in, um, you know, they've kind of got this little haven of theirs. Yeah, um, yeah. And I remember when you posted the pictures in the Cyberpunk Uncensored group on Facebook, um, that one in particular, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Am I reading this right? Like, this doesn't look like the map of Night City I know or like how things were laid out with the surrounding areas like South Night City and Haywood. And uh, you know what I mean? It just it looked different. Yeah. And, and that's when you explain how like they moved the city. They rebuilt the city on the other side of the bay. And, uh, and yeah, I, I totally saw the Arasaka um, waterfront thing. I was like, what the fuck is that? So, yeah, it sounds like they, they walled off their own little um, land and sea, a uh, little military base area or training area, whatever the fuck it is. But that, that's awesome. That's really cool. That, that can open up to a bunch of cool lore, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. The, the description of it is the waterfront is the bulwarked uh, island of corporate authority in the lawless sea of Watson. If you're not from Arasaka, there's nothing for you out there. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And, it, it, and it's written as if it was a journalistic piece. So it's yeah. a journalist who's kind of hitting all these places. And and he quotes the his guy, unless you're looking for something to steal, of course. <laughs> right. See, and there's some of that cyberpunk attitude and shit I love that they put in the writing, you know? Yeah. Yes. 
It's just yeah. it just sets the fucking mood, even from reading and learning, even before you get in it and start playing or like I don't know, just everything about it. <laughs> it's just yeah, all attitude and gritty. I love it. Yeah, and there is um, you know they go through a number of the places, but there is this. I found this. There's also this thing called North Oak, um, which is uh, it's the newest part of Night City, and it's the exclusive residential. It's a residential residential district free of poverty and gangs. Um, and mm -hmm. it's basically this walled area um, that you ha it takes a lot to get to. And like the rich live here. Uh, people dream of living here. So it sounds uh, the like, whole... like the old school, like the, you know, corporate zoned urban areas and stuff where like, you know, that's where all the corpse and their, their employees live or whatever, you know, the people yeah. that can afford it. Yeah, yeah. So, and some of them have just like vast estates. Uh, some of them have their mo own microbiome, an artificially created landscape. Wow. Um, yeah. So, and and they they got like a little ad uh, for each like each of the sections has like a little you know uh, in game ad of what it is. And this one is a um, Rayfield uh, erudite car substance and style. It looks like a you know high-end really expensive lexus that you would see today or, or something like that so nice. um yeah yeah so, i love how uh it, it definitely seems like you know they made it so raw and rough from 2020 like i couldn't even imagine they could but they fucking did taking it into red it's so cool and then it sounds like from red to 2077 there's like this huge gap where it's just like developing and growing and i think that's where like you have you know plenty of time to dive in and get your role playing on and work that whole timeline of growth through red and then it sounds like when you get to 2077 which obviously is the video game but when you get to that point it's like everything is back to you know how it was in 2020 per se but futuristic because obviously it's you know 50 years ahead you know what i mean it definitely yeah, seems like yeah. everything is like how i remember 2020 and night city and the cities and stuff but you know, on fucking steroids and on, on acid and shit, you know what I mean? Like it's just absolutely tri tripped out and expanded and even more futuristic without pushing the fucking envelope. That's what I love about cyberpunk is like it, it, it goes really far into that dystopian dark future and the sci-fi tech, but doesn't go too far into the sci-fi that it, that it, it, I don't know, detaches from me being able to associate with it enough to totally immerse myself in it when I play. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. I, and I think that's one of the great things that actually using the nuke in Night, Night City and the Time of the Red is they're able to basically keep technological development down and, and, and slow it and then kind of pick it back up so that it all still feels very um, realizable and connection with that and not take it too far out into the future. And you know, it, and it definitely retains all of those pieces of cyberpunk. There, you've got North yeah. Oak, but you've also got Pacifica, which is basically almost combat zone. Like the like Night City Police Department has said, we're we're out of here. We're not we're not coming into Pacifica. We you're you're all on your own. It's run by gangs, and everyone seems like okay, we're we'll just stay away from there. Yeah. Okay, that's so fine. that's the new combat zone. I I they don't call it the combat zone. Right. right. Um, uh, but it definitely has, it has all the same, um, it has all the same adjectives and shit yeah, <laughs> when, yeah, yeah. when talked about yeah. you know, or read about. Yeah. You go in there, you better go armed and armed right. very well. So well, yeah. now, what, now, what was that, Chris? What you guys were talking about, um, technology and ethics and laws and so forth goes in cycles because technology always outstrips the ethics mm. And then, you know, the laws, you know, like look at when the internet started, you know, look at uh, cloning, you know, when they started cloning Dolly yeah. the Sheep and all that stuff. You know, it's, we've always pushed technology, you know, as a culture. I mean, you know, I'm not talking about necessarily in the game, I'm talking about in life, you know, we always yeah. push technology. So what they were doing with Red and all that is they're taking a step back so it can start that cycle over again. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. That does make a lot of sense. I love it. But it's still... To me, they, they took it back with still keeping it ahead. Like it's still, like I, like I said, I couldn't imagine them making it tougher, but they did with still maintaining 
you know, cybernetics and tech and, and stuff in, in the way that they did. They just made it harder to get, <laughs> you know. They made those adventures in themselves, you know, their little side missions and shit. Um, but, yeah, hey, before we go on to anything else or wrap this or anything, because I think we covered the whole timeline, I, I love it, and I love where they're going with 2077. I want to hear from you, Chris, uh, because in the Cyberpunk Uncensored group on Facebook, <laughs> you commented there saying that uh, you have an unpopular opinion about the the uh, timeline of Cyberpunk or whatever or the – Explain that. Just I was just curious. When I got the when I got the red starter kit, and I opened up the timeline, the first thing I said was, "Oh man, they didn't update it." Like I, I was mad. I was like upset and mad, and I was like, "Oh man, yeah, I wish they would have updated it." You know, to reflect some of the you know things that happened, you know, since 2020 was written originally. You know, and, and I was like, but then it's kind of grown on me. You know. Like what? And, what are some examples though? What do you mean by that? Um, I'm well, like if confused. you look at like you know what they say happens in 2006 versus you know what really happened. I mean, sometimes oh, the truth oh, is stranger oh. than fiction. You know what I'm saying? Like, I see what you're saying. Yeah. The twin towers. You know, like that was a pretty pivotal thing, and instead of going into South America, we went into the Middle East. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. No, totally. They I committed to the timeline. Is they they, they remain when committed. I saw red, yeah, because I, I think every cyberpunk game master has always had this, you know, this thing like, well, you know, look at the cell phones. They, you know, they're, they're in the book. You know, that's all it's outdated a, stuff. It's a flip you know, phone. We want to update this. We want to update this, you know. And, but I've listened to some of the stuff that Mr. Pondsmith has said, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I love Mike Pondsmith. I think what he does is awesome. I, I love, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan, but. Watch your next that, words. You watch your yeah. next words, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but there was things like, like I saw. I was like, oh, man, I wish you would have done this. I wish you would have done this. Yeah. And and I even said on the you know the uncensored thing on Facebook, I was like, I think the golden age of cyberpunk, you know, where it really hit and where it really hit hardest was, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, you know. And I think in a lot of ways – you know, the game is 20 years too late. You know, the, 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 the computer game, you know, it's, it's 20 years too late. Yeah, I think if it would have hit when the RPG was popular, you know, very popular, yeah, I think it'd be a different story. I mean, we'd be much farther along in the world, I think. But that's, yeah, that's but, just, uh, but, you know... But I also think back then, you know, video games didn't have the... the tech that they have now or even the resource oh, no, space no, so agree, like you couldn't agree, you couldn't even have an open world which is what makes cyberpunk so popular it started with grand theft auto and games like that but the whole open world concept of a video game i think is what is the most attractive about those genres of games and i'm not a big video game guy i love virtual reality i run virtual reality live online we stream that too aside from mulligan live doing the the tabletop role-playing game stuff but um but yeah, video games, that, you know, the, the open world is what I think is so attractive about that. And I can see exactly what you're saying with, you know, wanting to match it a little bit with reality's timeline and just adjusting things to make more sense in that note. But I think it comes into a preference of play because I think there's two styles of ways that I see people get immersed in their game and just, die, you know, feeling it like it's real. And one way is like like you're saying. You know, it matches reality very well, and it matches the timeline to where you can kind of associate that with it, but with their own twist on the futuristic stuff. You know, throw cybernetics in there, throw these modern weapons and flying cars and shit, but stick with certain political and major life pivotal world moments, world news moments that really happen to kind of adjust to that so you can relate to it more and thus have it feel more real to you. But then for me, for instance, I'm like the other type of player. Like if, if it's too much like the real world, I start thinking about the real world and I get stressed and I and I start thinking about the shit that I don't want to think about. The whole reason I play role playing games and cyberpunk is to kind of take me out of reality. And, and to me, like I get immersed in in, in it as a game like uh, I just love the details that they put into this timeline and how they have it all make sense in its own. And that they stick to it. So I'm kind of the opposite. Like no, I, no, I'm, I I'm, like the fact that it's like set in stone, so to speak. It just feels real to me like that. But um, but I do see what you're saying. Don't get me wrong. I can debate both sides of this argument. I really can. But I'm just I prefer what they're doing and like how I just described it. But that's me as a player and as a GM. 
Well, and that's one of the reasons why I pulled out Land of the Free just to take a quick look at it because I was curious if anything had changed. Yeah. Yeah, but they stuck to their guns, you know, which. Yeah, it's right. you know, see, I like I, that. I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm good with it. But I think a lot of people, you know, um, when I know at the end of when that last fourth corporate war book came out, I was just like depressed. I was like, oh man, they just like tore down the whole thing. You know, <laughs> you know, when I first heard about the pocket nuke and what they were doing going into red, like I, I, my, I first had a pit in my stomach, like, oh, I'm like getting, you know, back into cyberpunk blowing up again and, and looking forward to the future when the game comes out, the video game is going to shed new light on the role playing side. And I don't know, it's just going to, I see it blowing up the same way that fifth edition did for D and D by streamlining things and then just coinciding with a bunch of other media platforms whether it be the animated show on netflix that's going to be coming in the next couple years or the video game or whatever but anyways i was all excited for that when i first heard about the pocket nuke and what happened in night city i just had a pit in my stomach i was like oh my god i don't know if i'm gonna like this (laughs) and then but then honestly once i once i checked it out and i read more and i learned more about red i'm like i'm fucking digging it i think it's just so raw I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, and like I said, I mean, when I first, I mean, I, I bought the PDF, printed it. Yeah, I work in a print shop, so um, I printed it right away, and I sat down with it, and I remember just thinking, oh man, you know, it's it's you know, it's not V three. We won't go there, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's it's. I, I thought they would have gone a different direction. Like it, you know, when I first looked at, it, I was like, oh. But it's grown on me, you know. I, yeah. I, I will say that it, it's grown on me, you know. I, and don't forget, it's growing within itself, so to speak. Like you know, it, it's the whole role-playing game side of it starts in red, and there's a long building process to get to 2000, uh, you know, 77. But it's there, and we know what 2077 looks like in the game and how far they've evolved within that time. And you see that timeline, like Patrick just read from the the Dark Horse art book, world book, you know cyberpunk world art book but uh it's like uh i don't know i'm excited about that because it's like you don't have to just be stuck in red you know like while you're playing uh, as as years progress like it's getting more and more like 2077 as you get towards there and i kind of dig that too that it's its own changing evolution within your own playing like if you want to imagine that shit that you know you can take your game there you know and actually that's one of the things so i was planning on putting my game them starting up in 2054 and the world of cyberpunk book actually provides enough detail for me. I'm like, ah, okay. So this kind of just gives me enough detail in that space before 2077, but after the 45 of, of red to kind of allow me to imagine a little bit better and to kind of set some things out for me. But it also that it didn't sort of, hamper me in any way it just said hey here's kind of what it is and so i can now run with it kind of set in, in 2054 so yeah no that's really cool I, I i ordered that book on amazon and it said like 10 left in stock and i got it and this was weeks ago but it still says delivery not till uh, august 10th or 12th for prime members and i'm like i'm and then i see everybody else posting pictures online over the past <laughs> couple of days that's when i was like what the fuck what the hell <laughs> I was like, I started sweating. I started sweating. I'm still mad about the damn Xbox. <laughs> this thing sold out before I even heard about it. I was like, what the hell? Oh, no. When it comes to the, the video game, man, that shit is like, uh, I don't know. It's even, it's even more intense when it comes to being able to get shit and keeping it in stock and keep up like with demand because that shit is just huge right now. Um, but, yeah, man, I, I think. You know, we covered the, the entire world timeline of Cyberpunk taking it up to 2077 as much as we can with given uh, lore and, and resources that are available right now anyways. Um, I, yeah. think, I think it's really cool. I love, I love what they're doing. And, um, you know, I'm excited for, you know, for more and more to come out and become available. Me too. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. thanks so much, guys, for joining me. Anybody listening, uh, make sure you share the podcast, you like it. Um, check out Mulligan Live on YouTube and check out the live game streaming that we do weekly. Make sure if you're on Facebook, you check out uh, Cyberpunk Uncensored, the group and the fan page, and also the Instagram account. But, uh, but yeah, we appreciate the support uh, to the Cyberpunk community. Any last words, guys? 
No, thank you for having me. It's been great fun. Yeah. Love talking cyberpunk. Oh yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Me no. too. I'm I'm big into the the cyberpunk genre in general. I mean, just anything I can consume, I'm I'm there. Hell yeah, I know exactly. That's why I wanted you guys on. You know, I see you in the in the uh, Cyberpunk Uncensored group, you know, p posting and sharing cool content and just, I don't know, interacting in a way that, like, when I read your comments and posts and stuff, I can tell that you know your shit or you're passionate about it, you know? And then, and then oh, yeah, and then Patrick, and I saw you were uh, GMing at Gen Con, uh, Star Wars game and stuff. So that was the other thing is, like, I saw that you actually GM as well. And I was like, hell yeah, right. man, I got to have these guys on and t at least chat about this stuff. And then when I saw you had the book, I was like, hell yeah, you can... I help help complete things from red to 2077. Yeah, thank you. So, and yeah, I'll be GMing uh, Cyberpunk next Gen Con. Absolutely. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, and where are uh, you guys online? Where can people find you? Are you guys ever post uh, your gaming or any of your things? I'm on uh, Twitter at Patrick Knaus, uh, and then I'm on uh, Facebook, and if you uh, go to uh, the Cyberpunk Uncensored uh, group. You can find me, and I have two brothers gaming uh, group with my brother on Facebook. So love to have you in that group. Hell yeah, that'd be awesome. I, I'm I'm not that cool. Yeah, <laughs> you're cool, man. You're cool. <laughs> you're no, cool. I mean, I, I just just life's got a uh, you know throwing me a couple curveballs. So I'm I'm busy right now. I got a new dog and nice. You know, kids and leaving for college and whatnot so i've got a lot going on right to right this minute so i don't have anything oh yeah well you at least you always have a home in the cyberpunk uncensored group and and with all of us man we, we love talking cyberpunk so we'll definitely be back yeah. on we'll do this this shit again man but thanks again for joining thanks everybody for listening and we'll see you next time take care all right thank you all right. thank you